Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this session on fly system ergonomics, sponsored by our friends at IATC 168. Thank you, IATC 168, for supporting us at this conference. My name is Manu Nelutla. I'm the executive director at Act Safe Safety Association, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Before we start this session, I would like to first acknowledge the traditional indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this session is online, we each still enjoy the pleasure of living within an indigenous territory. To highlight the importance of this acknowledgement, I would like to urge you following this session to visit the native land digital website and search the territory on which you are located. That website is www.native-land.ca. On to this session. As a certified ergonomist myself, I'm very curious about learning more about fly system ergonomics. And who better than to learn from than our speakers of this session, Rick Boychuk and Tom Heemskirk. Rick Boychuk is a specialist consultant in stage rigging and joining him is Tom Heemskirk, head stage carpenter at Victoria's Royal Theatre. This session is for 90 minutes and you'll have a chance to ask questions all through this session in the Q&A section below. I want to highlight this. Please do not put your questions in the chat. Please put them into the Q&A section down below in your Zoom screen here. Our support team will be browsing that questions and select three questions after each speaker's presentation for them to answer. We will also have time permitting and opportunity for more questions after both the presentations. So please keep sending your questions through the Q&A section. Without further delay, let me welcome Rick Poichuk to start the session. Rick, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Manu. Um, I, I just want to mention that I am joining this session from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am on traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory, and that the city of Saskatoon and all the people here are beneficiaries of this peace and friendship treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous First Nations, including Cree, Dene, Nakota, Soto, and Ojibwa, and is the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, we're, we're going to take a look at, oh, I, I guess, uh, Sam, I should be going to uh, share screen at this point, I guess. Okay. Uh, as Sam and Graham have been great at training me, and hopefully, uh, I do things well here. It looks like I've got a bit of a problem. Okay. How does that look, Sam? Everything look good? Good now. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, we're going to take a look at counterweight systems, manual counterweight systems, and uh, a safer way forward. Uh, it encountered, uh, I'm going to uh, go a little bit beyond ergonomics. And uh, our biggest enemy is, is actually gravity. And we're going to take a look at a couple of videos here. Uh, uh, very few people have seen a runaway counterweight arbor. Uh, if you're on, if you if, have, if you've been there for one, you were probably running away yourself. Uh, there should have been a, 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 a message to get just clear out. This is a, a video of we just called it an arbor drop. So uh, we're, what we're looking at is, is construction at Thurn Stage Equipment in uh, Winona, Minnesota. And they built a 40-foot drop tower to drop an arbor to see what would happen. And we're going to take a look at two videos. One is a standard conventional rod arbor. And the second one is a, a brick house, which is a front-loading arbor. Uh, the video itself, unfortunately, we didn't think to get a high-speed camera so that we could get good individual slow-motion frames. But I'm going to start this. I'm going to run it through once, and it lasts for eight seconds. Uh, the, um, and here we go. Okay. 
Okay, that's a standard rod arbor. Now, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run it again, but I'm going to stop it at a point. And uh, I'm going to stop it in the last frame before impact. And then we're going to take a look at what happens frame by frame. Here we go. Okay, uh, boy, I nailed it. That's the last frame before impact. So we're going to go frame at a time, and I might go backwards at points to point things out. Uh, you can see we've got a tension block at the bottom, and we've got uh, the, the bump rail at the bottom. Uh, that bump rail offers absolutely no resistance to what's happened, happening. And we're going to go one frame. I'm sorry. It's not. I may have technical error. I pressed the wrong button. That's what I should be pressing. Okay, so we're going to impact now. And we can see we've taken out the uh, bump rail. And we have hit the, uh, the tension block. Next frame. If we go back, it's difficult to see, but the rods are still straight. We move one frame and the rods are bent. You can see the stack of bricks that is not, no longer straight. It's got that angle to it. Well, the rods are bent. And then now we can more clearly see the rods. But what's happened is that it's actually, begin, it's, uh, this, is the, this is the second frame. We're going to go to the third frame. The, the load is bouncing up already. It, you see it bounced up and it bounced up further. Now watch the bottom of the stack of bricks on the arbor. It's beginning to kick out. I'm going frame at a time and it's still kicking out. And now it's going to start going back. But at this point, the bottom of that arbor has kicked out about three feet. Um, now, I've shown this to people that have been uh, inspectors going in forensically after the runaway. The owner said, come in here, tell us what happened. And uh, what one of the thing, what, one of the uh, inspectors from Tennessee, he said, you know, there's something that always confused me. He said, I would always find the bolt heads from the shoes on the far side of the stage. And he said, I could never figure out how they got there or why they got there. And he said, when he saw this, he said, that, the, the shoe just was ripped out. Now, I, I thank our lucky stars because we were standing all around this. We did not, nobody got hit by a bolt head. Uh, but, uh, so we're going to carry on. Ah, darn, operator error. Don't you just hate when that happens? Apologies again. Okay, we're at about the same place. I'm going to, I almost did the wrong thing again. Okay, so there's where we were. The, it's starting to come back in, but I want to point something out. Look where the tension block is. The tension block has been shot out from the, uh, the guide wall. Now the arbor is going to actually in, when the arbor comes back, it's going to grab the tension block and pull it back with it. So I don't know that anybody has ever videoed a standard arbor being dropped from 40 feet. Now, I, I want to point out uh, that's uh, an arbor that's capable of holding 1,200 pounds. Uh, it was loaded 50%, 600 pounds. Uh, they put the spreader plates properly installed. So this would have been a, a best case circumstance. 
I, I want to point out when when I first saw this, I, I walked through engineering. We all we we all made a mistake. It we called it an arbor drop. It should have been called an arbor impact because it happened so quickly. In real time, we didn't see it because we were looking up. And by the time we looked down, it was all over. <laughs> Getting the video, and I. I when I first saw it, I went down to engineering afterwards. Uh, uh, Jeremy showed me it and I said, you know what we just did? We just broke the flyman's legs. He said, what? I said, if a flyman had been standing there, that would have bounced out and broken his legs. And uh, so ne next I want to take a look at, uh, oh, sorry. Was there a question came through to me? No, okay. Um, I'm going to go on to the next video. And uh, this is uh, Thern Arbor. Uh, and we're going to see how that works. I was also at the Arbor drop at Clancy, J.R. Clancy. And the two Arbors performed exactly the same one to the other. So we're going to watch it, run through the whole thing uh, without stopping. <laughs> Okay, now we're going to run through and I'm going to try to catch it at the last frame before impact. Okay, we'll back it up a frame or two. Okay, so uh, there's the last frame before impact, I think. No, nope, there's the last one. Now it's going to take out the bump rail. And something that you'll note here, there is no bounce out of the arbor. What in effect we had, uh, we've got a crumple zone. Uh, if we're gonna go backwards now, we can see how the bottom of the arbor just crumples. And that crumpling absorbs the kinetic energy. Whereas with the rod arbor, the rods absorb them, but then it became uh, 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 potential energy. And the potential energy then manifested itself in the, in the uh, bumping out of the arbor, that three feet. So we'll carry on. And there's the end of motion right there. Now I'm, I'm not going to go back and do this but I counted the number of frames in both videos from the frame before impact to the frame at the end of activity. Now, uh, videos, I, I believe that these videos are running at about 29 frames per second. So we'll just bump that up to 30 frames per second. The rod arbor activity lasted for two seconds. The front loading arbor activity lasted for half a second. So one was 60 frames, the other was 15 frames. So uh, the amount of bad that can happen in two seconds is, is, is pretty astounding. Uh, I had already been working on a way to stop that. And um, I, I, I had developed and patented uh, the Arbor Trap. Now, uh, this is an installation of Arbor Traps. Uh, Sam Nod, can you see my cursor? You can, okay. So these are the Arbor Traps along here. Uh, there's one under each head block. There's one for every line set. Uh, th this is uh, the installation at the Grand Theatre in London, Ontario. Uh, it was to have been commissioned in August last year in advance of CITT, which was going to be held in London, and we would all be able to actually get up there and see this. So uh, that's one 
image. Uh, this is a second image looking at from above a little bit. All of the uh, lift lines and the operating line run through the trap. And uh, we've got, I've, I've got a video and it's, it's not a good video, uh, but it does tell the story. Okay, it's, it's very, I, I did this on my iPhone. Uh, when we get to uh, the important part, light does catch. Now there are two parts to, to the uh, trap. One part you can see here, which is the trap itself. The other part is uh, two blades that are attached to the arbor. And the blades ride up and down with the arbor and at the top of travel, enter the trap. So we're gonna take, a, uh, you'll see the blade will come into view in a moment. Okay, so that's the blade. I'm gonna take that back. Uh, the blade engages with the trap. Now they, sorry. Uh, the, the, the blade has this special configuration. It's mirror image on both sides of it. And uh, this, is, this is all part of the patent. And this uh, serration here is essential to its operation. Uh, at a time over some beer, if anybody wants to understand that, I can help. Uh, but the, you, you know what I should do? I'm sorry. I should just run the video once so you can see it. Here we go. Okay, and release. Okay, so the, the, the interesting thing about the operation of the trap, it is singularly unspectacular. You can, it, it looks almost like nothing. Uh, but I'm going to go over through the, the uh, frame by frame, a uh, little bit more than frame by frame. Oops, I should go to here. Okay, here we go. Uh, the, the blades and the arbor are going up. Sorry, my, my uh, track, track pad fell off, uh, fell off my chair. I'm gonna do it this way instead. So we're going up. It enters the trap. And you can see it's still going up. And then it stops and then it comes down. This, this is not working well, is it? Okay, we're going, yes. Oops. Okay, I've, I've pulled in a slow-mo feature here. Okay, now it, it has stopped. It, what, what, I'm sorry, this isn't working well. The, the, the blade goes up into the trap, becomes engaged, and the arbor comes down an inch and a half. When it comes down that inch and a half, it is now engaged. It is not going anywhere unless the operator lifts it that inch and a half, then pulls the release. And if the operator can't, cannot lift it that inch and a half, it means that the line sets out of balance. So that is the key to it. And I'm sorry, I'm going to just run it full speed again from the beginning. And you can see those little things. Okay, we're going, yes. Go. Now the noise makes, now you know it's engaged. Now it's locked, you can't go anywhere. Now we're gonna lift it an inch and a half, pull the cord, and it becomes disengaged. Okay, thank you. So uh, this whole issue of runaway arbors 
is close to eliminated. Now, when I say close to, to be engaged in the trap, the arbor has got to be at the top of travel. If something happens, and this happened in Winnipeg at the concert hall, if something happens mid-travel where the line set goes out of balance, the trap is not part of the equation. Uh, at, at the Centennial Concert Hall, uh, they had an, uh, an old main drape. The main drape snagged on the way up and the rip at the hem cascaded and 300 pounds of drape fell to the stage. The line set was 300 pounds out of balance. That's a different equation. I suggest that's a maintenance issue. Get your drape uh, uh, <laughs> changed out periodically. I'm going to leave the trap for a moment and go on to uh, arbor loading. Uh, this is a video that was uh, made uh, by Thurn Stage Equipment. I was involved with the making. Uh, we're going to uh, run through uh, the first half and then take a look at a couple things. Then we're going to run through the second half, take a look at a couple things. Here we go. I'm sorry, I should give credit where credit is due. Uh, this is up on loading gallery of Concordia, uh, the D.B. Clark Theatre, Concordia University in Montreal. Uh, this is Ted Stafford, the technical director there, and he's going to show us uh, how to load a standard arbor in his theatre. And in his theatre is going to be much like many theatres. <laughs> Now he's got kick plates there, so the backs of his knees are sitting on kick plates that are six inches high. Spin there. Texting me is that was just that, te texting me is not a good that idea. Was just Tom texting to see if you wanted more time because you've got five minutes left in your allotted time. But if you want a bit more time, Tom is willing to let you have a bit more time. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to take a look at that again. Okay. So the first thing that Ted has to do is he's got to raise the spreader plates out of the top plate out of the way. He's now uh, moving 40 pounds of weights. And you'll notice when he does the next one, he has to take one hand off the weights at a moment. The other thing that uh, he has to do is he has to twist his back. I won't go back to look at it. I, I, I'll try to stay within the five minutes. I won't go back to look at it, but he's got to twist his back to do the work. Now, this is uh, going to be the uh, Jubilee Aud Northern Jubilee Auditorium in Edmonton. Uh, they've got uh, a game brick house. Clancy wasn't available at this time. And we can see the loader now. He's, he's working on the ball, balls of his feet. He's, he's, he doesn't have to twist his back. He's facing the work. And uh, Ted had just moved 80 pounds. Uh, this gentleman here, whose name I've, I've forgotten, uh, he's, he's just moved 100 pounds. Rick, could you turn the sound down on the video so we can hear you speaking on top of it? OK. Uh, I think I, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I think that's the last video anyway. Uh, th this is a chart that I uh, uh, happened upon at some time in the past, and I've kept it. And uh, it's out of Europe, so they're using kilograms. We generally talk in pounds, even though we are metric. Uh, they, they've distinguished uh, the, the amount of loads that a man versus a woman can uh, can do. Uh, I, I'm not. We don't have to get into all of that. But uh, if you're bending down 
and lifting away from you, you should only be lifting 10 pounds. Uh, if you're lift, uh, and it doesn't get into twisting and how twisting impacts all of that. Um, oh, th this is a video, I'm gonna turn the, uh, it right off, set audio right off. Uh, th this is Paul Fujimoto Peel. This is at the Grand Theater in London. And uh, Paul is standing beside one of his arbors. Now, an important point about this is he, for most of our systems, we have to look off stage to do the work, but what we're doing is actually happening behind us. And we twist our backs and our necks under while we're pulling. This is one of the things that in, in the Netherlands, one of the problems that they, they, they found out uh, about the ergonomics of doing the work. Now with this as well, we've got a double purchase system and those arbors are 12 feet tall. So uh, Paul can work up to about six feet and there's another six feet of arbor yet to be handled. Uh, we, we never talked about what how they handled that in the past. Uh, nobody wanted to disclose, uh, fair enough. Um, this is uh, the, the Vienna Court Theater in, uh, in Vienna, Austria. It is the first recorded, uh, documented uh, counterweight rigging system. I want to show uh, some interesting things. We're, we're going to look upper left, there are four galleries. We're going to zoom in on those. Those are the four galleries that we saw. At the top, we've got a head block. We've got a block over here a block down here and a block down there. So we're gonna take a look up here first. And what we see is we've got the lift lines and the operating line come up, they go around the block. The lift lines carry on to the onstage blocks, but the uh, uh, operating line comes this way and goes down. And we take a look at the whole gallery again. The lift lines come, uh, the operating line comes down to this block here. We're going to zoom in. So it comes down to this block. The operator stands here. The operator is facing the activity on stage. Now, I suggest that they didn't do it for ergonomic reasons. Rather, uh, they had these deep uh, fly galleries historically maintain the deep fly gallery. And if the operator were here, which is where we would stand, the operator wouldn't be able to see what's going on on stage at all because the floor is in the way. So of necessity, because of the, uh, the um, uh, deep uh, gallery, they put the operator on stage. Uh, but I want to, uh, so we, sorry, repeat. This is uh, Joplin Scottish, right? Joplin, Missouri. And this was an installation. Uh, that last one was 1888. This is 1920s. And uh, we've got something interesting here on the right. We've got our arbors. Just on stage, uh, just to the left, to the right. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. To the left, we've got our arbors. Uh, just to the right at the floor level, we can see these yellow things. Well, that's ropes and the ropes come up and the operator stands with the arbors behind him and operating rope that he looks through and sees on stage. So that's what happens to the ropes. Now, now this is uh, Kazumi uh, Satomura. Uh, she's Japanese. She's a technical director and she's very busy in training in Japan. Uh, we can take a look at this is uh, if this is a temporary installation of a typical configuration and they don't have a locking rail. The way uh, Kazumi uh, explained it to me, Chinese people tend to be short and they can't get enough of this. So what they do is they, uh, or sorry, enough of this before they hit the rope locks. So what they've done is they've moved the rope locks down, they grab it and they act actually end up sitting on the floor pulling the rope to get that initial inertia uh, taken care of. Uh, the rope lock uh, is operated by foot. She's got her foot on the rope lock. That's how it's uh, open and closed. So it, again, ergonomically, they've, they, they've addressed a number of issues 
uh, they reinvented things for their own purposes. Um, I've got two more slides. I'm almost finished. Thank you for indulging me. Uh, the, on the left of the screen, we have the arbors, which cannot be seen. On the right of the screen, we've got the arbor, uh, the brick uh, benches, so that the operators don't have to uh, 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 bend down to the floor to pick up bricks. Uh, what also you can't see, the 12-foot arbor situation, th there's that dark thing at the top. That's a platform that is on hinges uh, in five-foot segments can be lifted out of the way. Also in that platform, there are slots. So all the bricks are stored here. There's a fly, a fly operate, uh, a loader at this level and a loader on the retractable bridge up top. And they hand the bricks up from this level to the upper level and vice versa. And they have a mid gallery. The vi short video of Paul was at mid gallery previously. What you will not, may not have noticed, there was no safety rail. So we've installed safety rails. Uh, the front loading arbor can be easily handled with safety rails. As a matter of fact, they're a benefit. Um, thank you for the spare time if I went over, Tom. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for wonderful. I mean, uh, I enjoyed the design elements in that the design ergonomic side of that thing, and uh, and wonderful to see. And it's interesting to see how how the design elements affects your physical aspect of ergonomics, right? Because now we have to bend, reach, lift, etc. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have two questions here. Uh, one is around actually, the, I, I'm think I'm thinking it's a, a comparison between the standard arbor uh, in the first video and the second video uh, with the brick house. Uh, arbor like uh, is it correct that the cage arbor did not kick out the three feet uh, like the other did so that's the question so i'm assuming that's that, that, that's exactly right the, uh, the there's an amount of kinetic energy that in the rod arbor gets transferred to the rods which causes the kicking up with the front loading arbor the kinetic energy is, is absorbed by the crumple zone now now somebody pointed out something the other day I did not design the front loading arbor to have a crumple zone. That was not the intent. However, once designed, it was quickly recognized that is a crumple zone. So uh, Great. I'm not Thank that you. right. <laughs> Thanks for answering that. Uh, there is one just a generic question. Can we have links to the videos? I think Sam may reach out to you after to ask if they get any videos link or if not, let us know. Um, they, they, are, they are on YouTube. And if I can safely travel in my computer now, I can find and I can uh, give them over to you, Sam. Perfect. That would be wonderful. Uh, there is one more question from my end. I'm just curious, ergonomist myself. So I'm, I'm asking, like, uh, it, would it be beneficial for people to kind of warm up or, you know, do some stretches as they are doing this? Because it's a lot of weights lifting and twisting and turning. So, you know, I, I, I'm just I, curious, I, would, wouldn't that be, should be a process, uh, part of the process? You, you know something? I, I've never heard of, uh, sorry, I've never just had this discussion with anybody, but it, but it does make so much sense. However, uh, having said that, there's there's a video out there. It's it's called uh, Sing Faster. It's it's the staging of the, the ring cycle from the point of view of stagehands. And their flyman, uh, he is actually pumping weights, not not counterweights. He's got his, his uh, weights up there and he's, you know, getting himself ready for everything. And so maybe he's already thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, micro breaks and those stretching would always keep that circulation going on and stretching the muscles not to be injured. Thank you, Rick. Wonderful, wonderful presentation there. We'll get back yeah. to more questions at the end of this session, hopefully. Uh, but now it's time to uh, welcome Tom Himskirk uh, to come and uh, enlighten us with his uh, uh, knowledge. Tom, all yours, please. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'm on the traditional lands of the Lekwungen speaking people, now known as the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. So welcome to the Royal Theater. I'm Tom. And uh, with me today is Warren, switching some cameras here. And Cameron Stewart is doing a bit of work with me up here. So I'm going to flip around here. And given that it's not as familiar, I'm going to give a quick rundown of how a hemp system works. Um, it's really simple. We're on a fly gallery. 
we got pin rails top and bottom to terminate uh, your line sets. Line sets, in this case, they're five lines. It's really like five spot lines. They go up, 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 way up to the head blocks, about 40 feet from here, over to the spot blocks on the uh, uh, onstage side, and then down and onto the deck, uh, where we would attach either a pipe or a batten, sometimes not either, and that's where the scenic load would get uh, attached to. Okay, so really simple. Um, the sets can be split up. I'll get Warren to switch to that uh, camera one there, uh, showing a line set that's split up. And here's Cam. Hi, Cam. So there's a five line set that's been split into two two line sets, and the center line beside is just sitting there, dead. It's just got a little keeper weight on the end. So that shows how really it's just a, it's just spot lines that are running together. So you can think that anything that you would do with a spot line. I would call it hamper rigging. Um, if you want to call it that, so much the better. So the next thing I'll get Cam to come to the number three border. So uh, the line sets are counterweighted not with a rod arbor or a uh, box arbor, but just with sandbags that are attached to the line set. In this case, we've got a batten with a border on it. And here's the, uh, the big trick here is that it is weighted stage heavy so that it comes in by gravity. So we even use the term we let it in and we take it out so cam if you could let that into its low tie and cam th this is about maybe 20 pounds 15 20 pounds stage heavy so it comes in nice and positively just hold that for a sec cam so now he's stopped and he's going to keep going coming all the way in so so yeah we'll just go that far um and take it out there cam so here's where the work starts cam has to pull down hold that and keep going so I was going to make him do this and just tie it off. I was going to make him do this like 20 times to show how the uh, ergonomics of this are uh, less favorable. But basically, you're overcoming gravity to take the piece out. So that's the primary difference with a counterweight system. Under normal operation, you just have to pull a whole lot more. And that's really, if you want to sum this up in one sentence ergonomically, you pull a lot here. So. Um, the uh, pin rails, as I've shown here, we've got a top rail, a bottom rail. Really quickly, we generally tie off the in trim on the bottom rail, the out trim on the top rail, if you happen to have double rails. We've got a second double rail at the back here. Uh, we use that for our auxiliary stuff and whatnot. Uh, so good and flexible. We can also increase the um, capacity of a line set by marrying two sets together and running it like a 10 line set. They're only six inches apart. So the fleet angles are within reason. And that's a way we can do like a heavy electric or something like that. Um, so we let it in, take it out. The heavier, the, the, the more stage heavy that the piece is, the better it flies, but it also hurts the flyman a lot more, or the fly person. So uh, let's talk specifically the meat here of this thing, specific safety and ergonomic issues. Um, Starting with the stage itself, um, I said we tie on battens and pipes and untie them. That means you're working at floor level. That does not work well for everybody, depending on how what shape your hamstrings are in. So that's one of the things about being a deck carpenter. Like typically, pipe you pick up the pipe, put it on top of your toe, tie the clove hitches, and then then set it on the deck, and then the fly crew takes over from there. That is one thing for the deck that is an issue, especially. You know, some people might not be as flexible in their uh, whatever age. Um, for me, I get a sore neck calling flies. I like on a long day, I'll be looking up for many, many hours. So I've got to be careful to stretch my neck out once in a while. Another curiosity is that getting hit by a, fly, by a flying piece is a thing because the, the hemp system is very, very quiet. Um, I've had a lot of people remark, yeah, I'm sure you have too, where it's like, geez, I didn't see that coming or hear that coming because you don't have the sound of steel cable over a steel shiv. You don't have the arbors going on T-tracks or guide wires. So we've got to be very, very careful to spot uh, fly pieces so that we, you know, and, and keep the area clear underneath the usual stuff. Uh, the fly floor, uh, kind of like the one Rick showed with the, um, the operating lines on the onstage side, we do have a tremendous advantage here because you face the stage in this case. So twisting around is not such a deal, but the visibility is terrible here because the fly rail is so tall. So it's really not a good view here. So spotting is a critical thing. 
Um, so we have two-way radios and wireless headsets and stuff. Now the rail itself, um, pulling is the big repetitive thing. Uh, you can get uh, people that have hand cramps by the end of the day sometimes, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> um, it's hard on, the, hard on the gut, on the core muscles. Lifting is another thing because we generally lift the sandbags up to get them, to attach them to the line set. Um, something to think about, the diameter of a line, these are half inch. That's not really big enough. If you're pulling a single line, it's, it's, it's really hard to actually pull on a half inch line. I, I found if there's some load on it. So you have, if you have an option for a single line, you probably want to go fatter than half inch. Um, this obvious one, Don Parman, vanilla slivers. Um, we don't have manila here anymore, but slivers was a thing. The slivers will, they'll, they'll go through your gloves like that. <laughs> they'll, uh, they will hurt you. They will fester within a day. It's annoying. Uh, a lot of fly people don't like to wear gloves. I'm one of them just because you want to feel stuff. I tried once having uh, curling gloves, you know, the rabbit skin ones, but the slivers went through the, the rabbit skin. Uh, contact with moving sandbags. We try to keep the sandbags above head high so that uh, you don't walk into them. But there are times when you have to, we call it bags in the floor. You pull the line set in all the way. So the bag is going past you. You have to be aware of that because sometimes you're concentrating so much on pulling that you forget that there's sandbags. Cam, can you just grab that leg right there and pull it in? Mm -hmm. uh, this guy right here. Yeah. So you can see what I mean, right? Perfectly quiet. So if you're unaware, you can get schmucked in the head. Um, also with uh, regards to Manila, especially, uh, foreign objects in your eyes. Uh, hemp slivers tend to shed off when you don't want them to and you are looking up a lot. So having an eye wash station, having uh, goggles is probably a good idea up here. Although like I said, th this is not so bad here and we keep the place pretty clean up there. So dust is less of an issue. Um, another one now we've got the, the floor here is pretty tidy at the moment, but uh, during a fit up you could have rope everywhere. So tripping hazards are a thing. We've got very good work light up here now. We didn't used to, but uh, tripping hazard is a deal here. Um, we also climb up a ladder to get here. This is a little incidental, but uh, climbing up the ladder, going through the confined opening is also a deal. So, but the good news is that it's not as bad for twisting because you don't have to do what you do in a, in a counterweight house where you're trying to spot it and spot the arbor at the same time. Here, you've got the ties right there. It's all pretty, pretty straightforward. So we're gonna go on to handling these things and why they're problematic. Um, we don't have a loading floor here. We're 30, 35 feet up, grids at 75. In order to get the full 40 feet of travel, we have to grid the, the piece first without weight, then counterweight it. So uh, how do you do that? Well, pull hard. Um, here's a number that relates to Rick's uh, chart there. As a rule of thumb, for a long day of a fit up, I kind of roughly count on 50 pounds a person to pull up to, to pull down on something. In theory, you could pull more pulling up because you have your core working for you. Pulling down, in theory, you could hang on the set and pull your entire weight, but you can't do that for very long if you can do it at all. Um, there used to be a practice where you'd grab these ropes and step off the rail and ride it down. That was when the rail was on the floor. Don't, do not do that at home. Um, but so to get a piece out, um, we would typically have four people here for something like a nutcracker with a lot of uh, drops. So four people can usually pull up a batten with a drop attached. You can get it to the grid without really straining too hard. But the point is that you can do that for several times in a row. You can pull more than 50 pounds, but again, how long can you do that for? So rule of thumb, 50 pounds a person. Uh, and four people is kind of a practical limit because you just can't put five people around a line set very easily. We won't demonstrate that because we've got to keep our distance here, but, uh, and also you get like lots of elbows in your face and things like that. So for heavier pieces, we would use a mechanical advantage of some sort, which we'll get into later. The sandbags themselves, um, problem. Now you don't have to go all the way to the floor because they got straps on them, but lifting them up, you're pulling that hernia time, right? So you got to be really quite careful with that. Then that's, that's the lightest sandbag we have. <laughs> Actually, it's not. So there's cam, you know. So big problem with moving stuff around. These don't have wheels on them. Uh, they, uh, we have up to 200 pounds here. 
And I think Cam, you, you have two or three people skidding those things around, right? Yeah. So um, Cam doesn't have a mic, so uh, he talks too much. <laughs> the, uh, it's a good thing. Yeah. The, um, but uh, the smaller bags, even then, you know, you, you grab one, you got to be careful of twisting. But um, why don't we show, uh, what, now's a good time, Cam, we'll show how instead of picking up a sandbag, we can use a, spa, a work line for it. I'll get Warren to pan over here. So the normal course of events, Cam, if you can just show how, how far you'd have to lift that. Yeah, not very fun, right? And even though it looks like it might take a lot more time, you can just tie this on a work line, get your compadre to do it. And you don't have that struggle so much then you would untie the work line. So we've gotten rid of a lifting motion, put it back into a pulling motion. I think that solves a lot of issues just doing that. So this is one of the methods to avoid the hernias, right? Uh, let's see, when it comes to dealing with uh, heavy loads, I'll just grab something handy here. The, um, at the end of the day, you take the uh, sandbags off, now you've got an unweighted piece. Uh, we don't have the benefit of an arbor trap or you know such things so uh the technique for belaying i'm just going to show this for those uh, that are interested here one way you can just leave it partly around the pin like leave partial wraps my favorite i'll step over here you can hold several hundred pounds like this right you can take your hand and push that tight for more friction you can hold quite a bit of weight that way and Cam would probably be backing me up here and holding the pin down. Thank you, Cam. Because when you're doing this, that, it won't do it now, but that pin tends to spin out. You do not want that because then you'll suddenly, very suddenly have all that weight in your hands. You won't be able to hold it. So, oh, by the way, um, I meant to say this earlier, but uh, are you ready? We are waiting for Mr. Boychuk to invent the front loading sandbag. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, where am I at here? Um, so to reduce physical effort, um, rather than taking the entire weight of a piece from the floor to the grid, one of the ways of dealing with that partly is to split a load. We could have, for instance, uh, a, a lighting pipe that's going to be kind of heavy. We could over what we call overbagging. We would put say 100 pounds extra on it. So you'd wait for the pipe plus 100 pounds. And then uh, you would use the work line to pull that in. Cam's getting our work line ready here. So we're going to imagine that this is such a pipe. So basically, it's, it's just like splitting a load uh, in, an, in an arbor house. You would put half of the weight on first, deal with that. And then you would, uh, here goes Cam. So he's pulling it, pulling that bag out using the work line slash jack line. I say work line. Glaram used to say uh, jack line, but we call them work lines. But if you stop there, Cam, okay, take it out a bit. So this happens to be in weight. And there's other occasions where you do that, like a heavier piece. So that now just stop there, Cam. Now, without using the work line, what happens? Like try to push the rope. It doesn't move, right? Going nowhere. So the work line takes the place of the loop, the operating line of a counterweight set. So if Cam pulls on the, uh, yeah, and I can grab this here. This is, a, I'm jumping ahead here, but this is way easier for two people to do. So Cam will tail the line, he'll spot it, spot it Cam, and uh, then he'll take it out. There you go. And there may be times when you want to do this for operating a piece uh, for a show, like if you've got spike marks close together, that sort of thing. Uh, so that, that's, that's a work line on a set. So you could overbag the piece, pull it in with more effort with the work line, put the payload on it, then you'd pull on the line set to uh, take up the rest of it, then you'd add the remaining half of the weight. That's maybe a bit of a bit of a thought through, but splitting, splitting loads is one technique that's available to us. Another way, uh, old fashioned, we don't even use it anymore here because we've got something better, is a block and fall. Uh, the one we have, if you're pulling down on it, gives a four to one mechanical advantage. So you would attach that to the line set with a trim block or a 
Sunday or a barrel knot, you'd attach the bottom end to the rail, you would start pulling on the block and fall. So if you dis, uh, disregard friction, you can, uh, uh, you've got a mechanical advantage of four to one, makes it a lot easier. The old trick was that we would throw the tail of the block and fall over the rail and make the lighting people that put the load on there, pull it out. So that's one way to control a load. Um, we have a capstan bolted to the end of the rail and that, uh, that enables two people to take out anything. But uh, that is um, uh, not too many places to have that. So I don't even know if it's worth getting into, but we can handle, we can handle something darn heavy using a capstan. And it's, uh, that's a very, very nice uh, uh, aid if you happen to have it. So uh, I've already covered the uh, work lines, how they uh, um, can be used to reduce the effort. And I've already covered how they aren't so good. Actually, Cam, let's just do that once more. Just show how you're doing that on your own mm -hmm. and why it's not so much recommended. Normally, if I do it on my own, I have it through the crook of my arm to load. Yeah. So at least I have a capture if I need to stop. Yep. So right off the bat, you got a danger of rope burn. Oh, yeah. you, you got stuff all over the floor. You got two different, three different things to look at, right? Not as good. Not so good. And if it wraps around your toe, you're in big trouble. Clear calm. Yeah, clear calm cables. As opposed to, and I'll just do it once more with a little snagged up up there. One sec. There we go. So here we go. Piece comes in and piece goes out. Just like so. Okay. So when it comes to a show call, um, I think I mentioned earlier, you tend to have the uh, low ties on the low rail um, so that when you let the piece in, it just goes to the, uh, the low tie, uh, which is very positive. It's kind of hard to go past your spike when that's tied off. And you pull it out to the high trim. Something to be aware of is that it's a lot harder to nail a spike when you're going out because you got to like pull it and stop it and hold it and tie it off while you're at the mark. I don't have a mark there, just pretend there's one. So it, uh, there's a... I was going to include this as a video thing, but I can't because it's Disney. There's a uh, video called Magician Mickey, and it shows, it's the greatest thing. It shows this uh, a vaudeville house, and the main curtain flies out, and it's all jerky because there's only one person pulling it. And then it shows him holding it with one hand and throwing a tie with the other hand. And then he uses his feet and his, uh, and his elbows to turn on the old-fashioned switchboard lighting board. So there you go. Yeah, got to see that one. Um, sorry, just uh, checking out my notes here, make sure I've got everything. Yeah, so that's a quick and uh, quick and dirty of uh, how a fly system works and some of the issues that are involved. We do have uh, some counterweight sets here, but they are always a fixed load. It's for our orchestra shell headers, and so that never changes. So there you go. Good questions coming. Thanks. Up. Yeah. Um, if you want to yeah, yeah, thanks, start Tom. questions, Manu. Uh, wonderful there. That, that was good. Uh, like, uh, I'm amazed by, by some of the solutions you're already talking about, like the teamwork thing there. But before I go into the questions, I want to thank that Cam for uh, demonstrating all of those <laughs> for us. Thank you, Cam. Wonderful there. Uh, so the first question uh, here is, uh, how do you navigate the rope pileup uh, while... Uh, uh, during the run of a show, right? Because there is all of that rope pile up, uh, especially when there are consecutive queues. So how do you navigate that? Uh, a wide stance. A wide stance, yeah. <laughs> um, well, as much as possible, you would, if you finish a queue and you know you've got a few minutes, you'd clean up the, the line sets from that queue. Uh, let me, uh, so let's say we've just finished with this, we've let a piece in. As soon as you can, you coil up the extra, get it off the floor. So that would be the, whatever the length of the move is, get it off the floor. Um, the other one that we do is uh, you don't lay out the sets until it's getting closer. So it's like you'd, you'd finish off your previous queue and lay out just the next uh, set, the next couple of line sets on the floor. And you, we, we tend to run them up and down stage 
so that you don't have a pile pile. It's more of a, of a track of, of rope. Um, so it, it, yeah, it's try to be as sensible uh, about it as you can, but there are definitely issues with that. I hope that uh, is enough of an answer. Yep, uh, that, that's that's wonderful. Thank you. So uh, somebody said I, you, you didn't uh, see me. So here I am. Okay, <laughs> my video works. Uh, so there is another question uh, uh, from Don, actually, especially Tom. Why a wood pin and not a metal? Oh uh, well, I don't really know. They're quieter. Um, they uh, they're lighter. They're strong lighter. enough. Uh, historically, we do have steel pins for uh, heavy heavy items if we're worried about capacity not that i've ever seen a pin break but you just don't want that to happen and the steel pin has the advantage that because it's heavier it won't spin out if you're belaying something on it but uh i think when wooden pins look cool yeah i typically hmm. use the steel pins for big scenic pieces or electrics yeah, yeah steel pins for heavy stuff belaying in the heavy pieces otherwise they're, they're heavy and yeah they don't look as cool yeah so some of the pins here are a little skinny so uh if there's any concern about the capacity of the pin we just swap out a steel pin great yeah, thank, thanks for that. I mean, that 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 makes sense in that way. Uh, before I go to the next two questions, I just want to remind everybody that we have time for question and answer. So please do send in a Q&A uh, so that even for Rick or for Tom. So just wanted to remind. Uh, the next question is uh, probably less of an issue with synthetic line, but have you run into safety issues with changing weight from atmospheric uh, moisture? Uh, not with changing weight because uh, our draperies aren't big enough that a higher humidity would make them that much heavier. Like if you had an enormous, very, very thick main curtain, you, if, I think this is what, what Mimi is, is alluding to, that the piece would absorb uh, humidity and get a bit heavier. Um, so it wouldn't, the balance would be less good. Um, the lines themselves, if you're using Manila, Manila does tend to shorten with higher humidity because what happens is it absorbs it absorbs moist, uh, humidity and they swell up and get fatter. They're also stronger when they're wet, which is the opposite of synthetic. So the issue we would have with changing weather is that if it rains overnight with Manila, you'd come in and you have to retrim all of the uh, pieces because the stage left end, like let's say the lines shortened, the stage left end would be a foot off the floor. So you'd have to you'd have to take the uh, cam. Would you just grab this border here, mm -hmm. and we're going to uh, the border the border behind you. So. To adjust that, we've got these finger blocks or trim blocks, whatever you call it. And, and so you can pull each line through this one at a time and that you would adjust the trim that way. But uh, that, I wouldn't call that a safety issue, but it's definitely an issue with, uh, with uh, a hemp house. These synthetic lines don't seem to have any propensity to the weather, but uh, you can rig something heavy and then the next day it'll have, uh, they'll have elongated a little bit. So you gotta watch your trims on that. Hopefully that's a good answer. Thanks, thanks, thanks for answering that. So, uh, let's let's hope, uh, Rick. Uh, this is open for both of you, Rick and Tom. So just jump in. Some questions are now coming in just because I asked them. Now everybody's active. Now, thank you for that. Uh, but uh, let's let's go with this. Uh, automation is prevalent in the Netherlands, and based on studies Rick spoke about, uh, if venue architecture allows it, uh, based on the fact that a double purchase counterweight system requires the double the weight to be moved, uh, is a single purchase counterweight system preferable for ergonomics? Uh, I think if you talk to uh, working fly people, they all love single purchase. They don't hate double purchase, but their preference would be single purchase. There's just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, sing, uh, double purchase, however, sometimes it just has to be, uh, be because of the design of the building or extra... Uh, as an example, uh, the, the Grand Theatre in London, which has a full double purchase system, their shop doors, uh, 12, 14 feet tall, run under uh, the, uh, the arbor wall. So they, they, they have to have that. In, in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, the downstage is single purchase, the upstage is a, a double purchase because it's upstage is the storage area for all of their acoustical towers. So you know, you, um, you, you just use, you, there are decisions that just can't be uh, about the building and its use that just can't be uh, changed. So the system changes. Uh, I mean, I mean, most of them are also talking about single purchase all the way in the in the comments too. So most of them agree with that. Uh, so uh, the next question I have here is, uh, 
sorry it was mentioned that soreness in the neck of course from uh, spending a lot of time looking up uh, while we are doing this uh, were there any other body parts where soreness from awkward positions on a on a fly rail uh, maybe cam can say that you know which position <laughs> <laughs> what is oh, actually really? so yeah. right now <laughs> sore back, sore back uh, from lifting sandbags uh, i remember very well my first day up here where uh, it was a pantomime or something and it was really sore right at the solar plexus like your your abdominal muscles and they were really sore the next day uh forearms get the claw you got the claw cam where your your thumb cramps that kind of thing good good thank you yeah in in, in the netherlands in in the netherlands uh there's a common misunderstanding people say counterweight systems were outlawed in the netherlands they were not but policy uh, directed people to w- away from counterweight systems, but they, they had their actuaries. Uh, th- sorry, uh, the Netherlands is a cradle to grave society, so the government is paying for uh, healthcare. The government also owns a tremendous number of theaters, and so th- their actuaries got to wondering uh, why there were so many injuries in theater because they, they got the numbers because they have the healthcare system. Oh, we've got all these stage hands having back injuries. So they went to, to the theaters. They say, you know, wh- wh- why? And, and they all, all are flymen. Well, what's a, what's a flyman? <laughs> so, 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 so they, they found out and they, they've discovered that uh, there, there were two major uh, causes of the back injuries. One was, uh, uh, loading, picking up bricks and putting them somewhere, uh, because you, you have to. Uh, we saw Ted with his legs draped over the catwalk. Well, at that moment when he's loading below the catwalk, that's a good idea. But then he gets, he'll get to a point where the the bricks are just above the catwalk. And what I would do, what many people do, is they get down on hands and knees. And you're picking up a brick from your right and on, on your knees, twisting your back under load and reaching out over the, over the void and putting the brick and doing it again. <clears throat> uh, Ted's bricks were 40 pounds. Uh, I was down to South America and I, I saw bricks that were 80 pounds. You know, and it's the same problem you're 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 twisting your back under load and uh that that was one of the things in in concept how do we get away from that so uh in the netherlands that was one of the problems the second problem was that people the 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 fly operator is facing the offstage wall but has to turn around and look at the same time as uh having a 500 pound piece that the fly person has got to get moving. And so the back is under a tremendous amount of strain because of the twisting. So uh, those were the two things that I heard were the biggest issues in the Netherlands. And, and as, as I talk to fly people, you know, they, they say they've got back problems and, and yes, I was doing some simple task, but, wrong that day they didn't stretch what a wonderful idea stretching actually, actually that's that's an interesting question because one of the questions that talked about is how do you prevent that uh, repetitive twisting because of facing the other way right like when you're uh, when uh, your back is uh, to the stage how do you prevent this twisting any any solutions there or any suggestions uh, th- th- having spike marks and and trusting them but but then the problem is you see not only are we dealing with the piece and moving the piece and hitting the spike mark, we don't want to hit performers. And so you you want to kind of keep an eye on what's going on, uh, or you have to have a spotter or the stage manager. Anyway, there, there's some, yeah, if we, if we trust everything to go well, we can just be looking off stage. Well, great. Yeah. I mean, again, 
there are a lot of we we, can, we, should, we all should brainstorm this on ergonomics definitely tom this next question is for you how do you keep track of line uh, of which line is which for example short 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 or long long etc well, how do you keep track uh, of those lines there's two ways one is by convention we lay them into the trim block in a certain order with a certain orientation which helps but uh, the better thing i'm going to hold this up and if maybe you might be able to see it we've got colored yarns in the uh, in the ropes oh As yeah you see that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that was uh, when we purchased these we uh, got our uh, distributor to ask for this now the normally they don't do it on a small order of 40,000 feet uh, <laughs> that's so we had 40,000 feet with the the rogues they call it rogues yarn or a tracer yarn in it but they uh, they were nice to us so we've got black green blue red and none or white made mm -hmm. a huge difference in trimming Interesting uh, solution there, right? <laughs> Great. Yeah, and, and better lighting so you could see what was going on. Better lighting, true. Yeah. Uh, so there's another question. Uh, Don wants to know if you have the choice, Arbor or Hemp System? Rick? <laughs> well, Tom is dyed in the wool hemp. And he, yeah. he, loves, he loves it. Uh, and it. It's an elegant system. And sometimes it is just the, the answer. Uh, yeah. It, it, again, it comes down to the building. Uh, to uh, Tom, how deep uh, off stage? How deep is your fly floor? Uh, our fly floors are fourteen feet deep. Yeah, you see, so a counterweight system would would require a tremendous amount of alteration to the building. We so, lose the wall, like that. We, if you have, if you have, even if you just have uh, the tension blocks on the floor, we would lose three or four feet of wing plus operating allowance if if there if it was operated from the deck purely as an operator i would take camp every day oh yeah cam cam endorses hemp for sure as um, an operator as an operator every day yeah every the, day. there's a flexibility and uh that serves things like the operas really well because we can mess around and split up line sets and fly things at diagonals and that sort of thing um but when when a 1200 pound piece shows up then we got a problem and thanks for that uh, answering that and uh, yeah we'll go with cam's uh hemp system too why not you know cam is using it <laughs> yay cam that's the mis message i'm getting here uh rick uh, this is a question for you how do you stop the trap system from locking uh, during a show if a set piece has to be flown all the way out excellent question um if a piece has to be flown all the way out the ar arbor is at the bottom of travel the only time that the arbor is at the trap is when the batten is within two inches of its bottom of travel. And, and um, there, there's, a, there's a portion, there, there's a range, to, just to expand on that, there's a range. Uh, the batten can be at low trim up to about working height. I call that the utility area. You're, you're not going to do anything. You're, you're not, you're, when your arbor is, uh, when your batten is down at the bottom, your arbor is at the top. That's when every, all the bad stuff happens. When your batten is at the working trim, that's, that's, it's got a piece on it and, and it's in the show. Your arbor is ha halfway, nowhere near the trap. And when you fly out, your uh, batten is at uh, high trim and your arbor is at the bottom of travel, nowhere near the, the trap. It's only that last two inches when the batten is at low trim that your arbor is near the trap. Hmm. Thanks, I, I, thanks. I've never had to answer that question, so I hope that, <laughs> that explains. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks for answering that. And uh, there is a question here. Uh, I think uh, Tom was mentioning about labeling. So, how do you label fly pieces at the Royal Theatre? Oh, um, quite often, uh, Warren maybe can help us out here. Uh, we've got lots of gaff tape and fat sharpies. Uh, sometimes we label the sandbags themselves. Here we go. Number three border. There we go. <laughs> all sorts of tape. Uh, we could label the top of the rail. We could put a flag on the set itself. Um, I should point out that you can't overdo this. The last thing you wanna do is grab the wrong piece. So you would uh, make it really super obvious. Here goes Cam with a piece of whatever that color could be called. Around only one of the lines. Just, just around one line so that you can still change the trim on it if you need to. Um, I should point out too that uh, one of the things for keeping track is that the pieces that are in are tied off on the low rail so you can see very quickly which pieces are in. 
that's one advantage to having a, having a, a double rail. But uh, yeah, basically just label it as much as you need to with whatever method you got available. Great, and actually I saw from Don here comment that uh, we also used to mark them on the floor. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, tape, yeah, we haven't tape. done that, but that's definitely a possibility. True, thank you. Thanks for answering that. Uh, there is another question here. Uh, could, uh, could a mirror just above head height along the offstage side, but on stage of lines being pulled that would allow operators to view the stage while pulling lines? Will that, that work? The lighting guy says no. <laughs> the lighting guy says no. <laughs> um, the, um, here you'd, you'd run into all sorts of things. We have very little clearance between the rail and the, the flying limit. However, we do have, a, I'm looking at it right now, which is why I'm not looking on camera directly. Uh, we've got a big fat monitor up here with a front shot on it. So at least there's some hope of seeing uh, hazards below. But uh, a mirror could be a thing, uh, maybe a little skylight through the fly floor or something too. But uh, a mirror, I could see I could see application for that. It's just here, I don't think it would work, but uh, I, I like that idea. But that, that's an interesting point because it's always important to look at the systems too, right? One, one may work for you, but that may not work for somebody else. So we need to think about all that design elements, right? Like lighting would say no to that. <laughs> so it's an interesting concept. So uh, this is for Rick. Uh, Rick, is the release cord uh, of the Arbor trap best operated from the loading rails? or does the rope go down to op rail? Just thinking of an extra rope not tensioned uh, in the way of operating ropes. Um, th that comes down to, I think, personal preference. Uh, my preference would be that it's operated at loading level. Um, but I, I've never run a theater to really know. Uh, in at uh, the Grand Theatre in London, uh, they have chosen that. Uh, the The only time uh, that we're really something to remember that the trap only engages in that last two inches of travel, and that last two inches of travel is when uh, will always happen. I, should, I shouldn't say always. <laughs> Generally, you've got a flyman or you've got a, a loader upstairs at loading gallery when you do that last two inches of travel, uh, when, when the baton is down to absolute low trim. Uh, but other people think that uh, it should uh, gravitate towards wanting it down to operator level. Uh, we've uh, conceived of, uh, of some uh, eye bolts. Uh, one for each line, a, cu a couple of control, keep them away from the operating line, all the way down. And, you know, but uh, in point of fact, the Grand Theatre is the first full installation. So they've they, they bravely uh, gone where nobody else has yet gone. And so uh, we'll see. Uh, it's a learning curve for everybody. Uh, they're, they're, they immediately wanted it, and uh, they they're doing it. So a year from now, perhaps when we're uh, at the uh, London CITT, uh, we'll be able to talk to the guys and find out how they feel. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Rick. Uh, there are, we are less than, uh, actually for less than 14 minutes here and lots of questions coming in. So let me try to get, get through them. Uh, Tom, uh, a safety issue getting up to the fly floor? Oh, uh, yeah. Here we have a fixed ladder from the stage floor to the fly floor. It, go, it continues on to the grid. Uh, so being a ladder of that height, we have a permanent, um, uh, there's one's got a shot of it. We've got a uh, lifeline uh, with the rope grabs going up the middle, that, that's a steel lifeline. And uh, yeah, and because this kind of thing, harnesses belts. Hmm. Sure, thank, thanks for that. Uh, there is another question that I just wanted to uh, go, maybe Tom could dance, uh, talk about that. I, I have always used, uh, Flags on my ropes, short piece of fabric tucked in between rope lace instead of tape. Why don't you use this method? Um, it just hasn't caught on. Uh, well, a couple of things here to consider. Um, the uh, This is a fairly tight laid rope, so it'd be quite a trick to, you'd need a spike to get into the line to do that, which is uh, a steel tool that you can drop over the rail. So I'd really rather see tape as a, uh, as a thing, but I think it's whatever works for you, right? I mean, uh, we've just, 
that we just use tape. Uh, some people, you know, you put a piece of yarn through it or a ribbon wrapped up around the lay and stuff like that. I think it's whatever works for you. you but, okay, have a house configuration. Yeah. House configuration is low rail, otherwise the bag's above control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the other thing too, is that we don't need to spike nearly as much because out is typically with the bags floating above the rail and in is on a low tie. So we probably spike less than half of what a counterweight house would. Oh, great. Thank, thanks for that. Uh, the next question is, Rick, do you have any plans for a storage uh, position version of the trap? Not specifically for reweighting, obviously, but for a secured storage option. Well, uh, y yes. However, we've not conceived of it for storage. Uh, we've been working on it because uh, some, some theaters don't have loading galleries. And so they do their loading with the arbor at the bottom of travel. And of course, uh, if, if they're moving lighting fixtures, that's when they, they end up in runaways. So uh, they, we, we uh, so to speak, uh, the patent gives us the territory above the arbor and below the arbor for the purposes of pre uh, pre preventing runaways. The trap them. can be installed uh, uh, right side up or upside down and work. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, uh, but it wouldn't be for the purpose of storage. Uh, although I like that, I'm gonna have to process that. I like that. <laughs> it's always good to have these discussions and getting questions yes. and ideas, right? Yes. Wonderful. I mean, that's wonderful. Thank, thanks, thanks for answering that, Rick. Uh, well, Tom wants to. Yes, oh, yeah. just to jump in, uh, the McPherson, our the other theater, uh, does not have a loading floor, so we are splitting loads constantly. Uh, bull lines uh, is one way of handling it. That's my favorite way. Uh, and it, is yeah. and it is an arbor system. That, yeah, that, correct. And uh, so, uh, and just because yeah, dealing with an out of weight, uh, like a full travel with an out of weight arbor, uh, that scares me more than this does. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks, thanks for that, Tom. Uh, there's one question, but I think you answered it. I uh, just want to remind you, everybody, 10 more minutes. So shoot your questions. Look at that wonderful discussion we are having here. Uh, can Tom talk about safety protocols for us accessing the fly floor from the deck? I think you did talk about that. Um, to yeah, add I just, to that? just really quickly, uh, it's only, yeah. crew, only crew and very special guests go up here, and everybody uses the ladder climb safety system. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so how much uh, more effective is the arbor trap than applying line locks to the operating lines by means of twisting them with a bar? Oh, that, that gets into a, a pr profound discussion. Um, the, the ANSI standard for counterweight systems does not embrace having the counterweight line sets out of balance any more than 50 pounds. Uh, this, this is all concept discussion and I've had a lot of, I've discussed this a lot. Uh, whiskey sticks, uh, uncle buddies, uh, snubbing the line, uh, any of the other methods of using out of, uh, holding out of balance line sets do not conform with the ANSI standard. They're done all the time and, and they're done effectively and they're done safety, safely. Uh, come that day that there's a failure using one of those, well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 uh, the, the trap was originally conceived to prevent the known runaways uh, Nobody's done numbers on this, but I'd say 95% of all out of balance line sets happen by accident. Uh, people aren't following procedures, they're not listening, listening. they're not understanding correctly, they're tired. Uh, and that's where most of the runaways happen. Um, I, I say this because of the anecdotal evidence. Uh, nobody's done the survey. That's a really good idea. Somebody should do the survey. Anyway, uh, so that's what the trap is, uh, was initially conceived to do. Um, the, uh, the notion of holding, uh, 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 according to the ANSI standard, a line set should always be in balance within 50 pounds. That's it. If you're operating out of balance, you're, you're not conforming to... Now, that is 
whiskey talk, not just beer talk. Sit down and just because every operator is different. Every operator has a different philosophy and, and uh, everybody has different experiences. So I'm not going to argue with them people. They, they know what they're doing. Uh, I, I have somebody uh, that says we should not, the, the trap shouldn't be used. People should know how to do it properly. There's no argument. People should be trained to do it properly. We still have runaways. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, answer. Uh, there, there's one question. I think. Oh, two more. Okay. Let me check it out. Uh, how important is it that students studying technical theater or production are safely exposed to a variety of lifting systems, including both hemp and counterweight? Tom, you want to go for it? Yeah. Like it's um, important. Um, <laughs> I would say that it's really important uh, to learn everything that you can about all these things. Um, you know, a wider uh, knowledge base. I think it just gives you more. Uh, tricks to solve problems with. Um, and uh, I think especially with hemp, you get a knack for it, right? And if you don't have any exposure to it, you, you, you might not have that knack. Just just something, I don't, it's hard to explain, but you just you just get a feel for things in a different way. Great. Uh, one last, uh, sorry, some, Cam wants to say oh, something there? Yeah, if, <laughs> like, but if, if somebody says, hey, can you spot, spot a line, like a single spot line somewhere, that's part of hemp rigging. You should know how to do it. I, I've, I've had the, the good fortune to travel extensively throughout North America and beyond. And in the travels, visited many universities. And uh, I, I have to say that most of the universities have really good people and really good programs and do it. But I was surprised how many uh, post-secondary institutions, nobody knows these things. No, nobody... and. and <laughs> I, I'm flabbergasted that they should have this machine because that's what a, a rigging system is. It's a machine and nobody actually knows how to use it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, there's one last question. Uh, that's the last for today. We will take it. Uh, so uh, can you please comment on the importance of maintaining and using weight locks on uh, rod arbors? Uh, Eric, that's my friend, Eric. Uh, Eric, I think you're, you're, you're talking about spreader plates weight locks. Oh, and the tops. Uh, I, I, I once, uh, when I was consulting, I had somebody come in and take a look at a counterweight rigging system. And I, I, I'm showing him up the system. And he was looking at the floor. I said, Steve, why are you looking at the floor? He said, I'm, I'm wondering whether they dropped any weights. I said, how would they drop weights? Well, if, if the arbor bounces and the weights fall off, they fall onto the floor. And it's, it's, a, it's a forensic bit of evidence. So, so the, the, the weight locks, which, which would locking collars at the top of the arbor, as well as the spreader plates uh, should be locked. And because what, what happens is that the arbor can bottom out, even under normal use, it hits a bit hard and the brick bounces up and could fall off and, you know, it, things can go out of balance. So uh, both, of, all of these products have got to be used properly. Historically, there was a time that we didn't have uh, weight, weight locks, we didn't have spreader plates, but over the years, decades, uh, we came to recognize these are really important. So when you receive that equipment, know how to use it and use it. Great. So uh, Eric, really important. <laughs> Hope I, Eric, you got your answer there. Uh, Rick, thank you for that. Uh, Rick, any last, uh, any any final words from you, like uh, before you end this session? Before we end, anything else from you? Um, I have sent some uh, URLs for YouTube for videos that were more better edit, uh, edited. As a matter of fact, they were edited by uh, Jay Glaram and Rocky Paulson, and so they're 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 credited in there. Uh, and they do the slow motion really well. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I couldn't use those. I couldn't get them. Anyway, long story. So uh, uh, Sam will be, Samantha will be uh, making that information available. We just got them. Thank you very much for sharing them. And thanks, Sam. Tom, anything, any, 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 any more wise words from you? <laughs> <laughs> nah. Um, thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Manu. Thank you, Cam. Thank you, Warren. Uh, real pleasure. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to Cam and Warren too. Thank you uh, for demonstrating that, Cam. It was wonderful and lovely visuals there. We appreciate all of that. And hopefully we can visit sometime again. Myself, definitely. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but what a fantastic session. I mean, lots of discussions around ergonomics, fly systems, and, and uh, lots of uh, uh, future uh, ideas for us, all of us to ponder upon. So thank you very much, both of you. Uh, so thank you, Tom and Rick. Special, special thanks to you. And, and not to forget, Thanks to uh, IHC 168 for sponsoring this session. Yay, huge support for us. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much and have a great day.